Hello everyone, my name is Carrie Wolf and I'm the Exhibition Director here at the Dairy Barn Arts Center located in Athens, Ohio. Today I have three artists who are going to do an artist conversation um, that ties with our Women of Appalachia Fine Art Exhibition, which is on view now. I'll go ahead and let you three introduce yourselves. We'll start with Patty. Hi, I'm Patty Kennedy Zafra and I live in Murraysville, Pennsylvania in Western Pennsylvania but I was born in Springfield, Ohio. And um, then again, after that, lived in Cincinnati, Ohio. So I'm certainly familiar with this area where the dairy barn is. Ayla. My name's the Buskirk and I live in Mineral Wells, West Virginia. And I, I work with uh, wool fiber and wool paintings. And Sarah. My name is Sarah. Um, I live in Athens, Ohio. Um, I'm currently a student at Ohio University and I'm an oil painter um, primarily. Awesome. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you three. I will start with uh, one of the first questions. I suppose I will um, address it to Hala and say, what is your tie to the Appalachian region? It's kind of obvious that you live in West Virginia, but you can go ahead and explain anyway. It seems obvious um, since Pennsylvania is part of the reason too. I did. I am from Pens Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We were talking about um, that tie with Patty, but um, I always that I got here as fast as I could, and I um, love living here and. As far as ties to um, the region, my I'm probably I don't know I'm team generation of um, Appalachian crafts people, so I really feel like this is my home. I'm also a um, jury member of the Tamarack West Virginia artist family, so that's. Um, a big deal in West Virginia, and Tamarack really does a good job of supporting their West Virginia artists. Well, that's wonderful. And Sarah, you go to the Ohio University. You're a student. Congratulations on on being accepted into this exhibition as as a student and being one of the more youthful uh, members of the group. I have a feeling. And the connection beyond the fact that you go to Ohio U, are you also from Ohio? Yeah, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. And um, I lived in Athens over the summer. This is the first um, house I've lived in away from home. And I'm fortunate to have the opportunity to kind of live in Athens now as a young adult and kind of make my way in the world. Um, in Appalachia. That's wonderful. Kayla, it's your turn to ask a question. <laughs> but what about is your you, you told us that you were born in Ohio or you um, do you feel connected to the Appalachian? I know you do your pieces do a lot of history. Right. I, I indeed do feel um, connected. I the pieces that are in this particular exhibition are part of my American Portrait series, which um, when I first discovered those Im images, they just look familiar to me. And being, you know, in Springfield, Ohio, until I was almost 14, those were faces I just felt comfortable with and I recognized. And then of course the Native American series really related to me because of the, they addressed that whole movement of, Native Americans from Ohio, from West Virginia, and all those areas, and, and to the reservations of the West. So yes, they're both part of that. That's great. And that was actually another question which you've um, helped us with, is you do a lot of series. And this is a part of that series, but you do quite a few quilt, art quilts that are in series, correct? That is correct. I do tend to work in series, um, I will say. Um, that the Native American piece that is at uh, the Dairy Barn right now is the last three, I, I do fundamentally large two-dimensional work. 
So then the accordion books became sort of like a byproduct of the prints that were remaining from those large works. And when I decided to print the, the women and the girls, the Native American women and girls, I realized I had this large series. I was wanting to close that series and that I had neglected to include women, which I felt I couldn't close that series without doing that. And, and the American Portrait series has boys, girls, men, women, all that are, it's all related to issues of the independent family farm. So for me in Ohio, in Springfield, in Columbus, anywhere that there are farmers, independent family farmers, it's an issue. So yeah. So important. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what about you? Are you your piece part of a series or? Um, I've been really interested on in like psychogeography and basically how where you are um, physically like affects your place mentally and um, moving from Columbus to Athens I feel like really a kind of affected um, like my mindset about everything um, coming into the world as like my own person and so um, my piece in the show is kind of like my beginning stages of exploring this topic um, and I definitely feel like I'm beginning to explore this concept in a lot of my subsequent pieces. And do you always work oil on canvas primarily Sarah? Um, yeah that is my preferred media. Okay. Um, I did some printmaking um, with Ohio University, um, but I typically am an oil painter, and I made the transition to oils um, when I was about 19, so not too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you have a long, long, beautiful future ahead of you, I have a feeling. I hope so. And we may see some more, more pieces like the one that you've submitted. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I work in series at all. Um, I have a ton of ideas in my head that are completely different from each other. And I, I don't foresee that becoming a series at any time in the future. Okay, um, the next question, um, do you all feel that you're a morning, afternoon, or evening studio time artist? Well, um, my work occurs all the time. And so I'm, it, you know, if I'm dyeing fabric, which if, I, if I'm using vintage feed sacks, which the one book is made of, but a lot of my work, I would say, is primarily hand dyed fabric. So if I'm dyeing work, I will dye for two to three weeks before I print. So I'm doing two or three batches of dyeing. And so then I do start that in the morning because it, you know, I can get two runs of dye in. Um, so hand dyeing all of my fabric pretty much keeps me, you know, I go out in the morning for a walk or if it's bad weather, I go to my local Y and then I come back and get to work. And so, <laughs> yeah, I would say late morning afternoon <laughs> I agree I don't really have a set studio time um, I don't have a scheduled time and so it's more you know when I can fit it in with the family or can fit it in with um, everything that else that's going on we we live on 42 acres in West Virginia hills and hollers so sometimes there's you know there's horses to take care of and dogs to walk and woods to hide and inspiration to find and and so it's any time of the day really yeah we're lucky Haley Sarah has to uh, has to go to class so but <laughs> I would I would think that having um I don't have an art degree I have a, a degree in journalism and a minor in photography so I do um recall those times I was working full-time as well so I did I was usually in the dark room late at night or early in the morning. <laughs> I used yeah. to actually have a real dark room. <laughs> so anyway, 
All right, the next question, I guess, is mine. And it is, what processes were used in making your work? So we'll pop it back to Sarah, since we were just talking about oil. You use oil paint, your preferred media. Um, any other process that comes into play? Do you sketch in advance or do you um, work from photographs? For example, the work that is in this exhibition, I'm curious where that concept came from. Yeah, so typically I will just, I'll get inspired um, from my day-to-day -day surroundings in life. And um, I will ask for my friend volunteers to, um, pose I do a lot of figure painting so I will need models and um they'll pose I'll take some reference pictures and then I will create like a composition in photoshop um that combines different aspects of different pictures and then I just sketch it onto the canvas do an underpainting in like raw sienna or raw umber and then go in with color after laying in all the values Oh, that's fantastic. So you, you do rely on some digital parts just to yeah. organize your photographs and to sort of fine tune your inspiration. Yeah, I definitely feel like if I'm able to kind of create like a Photoshop mock-up of everything um, before I begin, it helps me feel more methodical with the painting process and then I can be more efficient with getting everything mm -hmm. um, depicted accurately and definitely getting all of the proportions right um all the colors stuff like that very good i like i like that you use your friends as models yeah. that's all awesome. <laughs> they're very helpful i'm very fortunate for my friendships yeah that's great because it's very tempting at times to use you know just stock photos or or something like that and and to actually talk your friends into modeling for you and and getting that makes that just brings your art to another level. Yeah, it takes a community, really. It does. What about your process, Hala? Well, my process uses um, one of the most renewable, oldest resources we have. So, you know, there are there are sheep and have been for many years. And I use other fibers like natural fibers. There's you know sheep and alpaca and camel are probably my three favorites. But um, I I spinning and dyeing of my yarn, and then generally my what I like to do and what you see in my piece at Athens is that I knit with that yarn. I then knit a a roughly rectangular shape and then felt it. So I wash it in hot, slopey water and get somewhat organic shape because every wool felt differently. And then I dry it. And from that point, I see what it says to me because I use different colors in that canvas, um, making you know different yarns, different dyes. And this one then, so then from there, I use more wool little bits of different dyed wool and I paint with that wool. I blend it just like you would paint. And I paint with it with a little barbed needle, uh, one single needle. And that's just like using a brush. Only for me, I'm tacking that wool down on the can. That's my process. Great. Um, can, what about a little bit more about your process, Patty, because it, it sounds very involved. Um, it depends. I mean, really, like I said, the um, uh, primarily the uh, the work I do is two dimensional, very large um, art quilts, and then I hand dye all of my fabric, and which is done with shibori techniques, clamping techniques. It's all crochet on MX dye. Really love the dyeing process. I absolutely love screen printing. Um, it kind of reminds me of when I had my dark room and you put a piece of white paper in a tray and you start tipping it and it's like magic. That's the way I feel with screen printing. I pull the squeegee and I lift it up and it's like, <laughs> you know, I get like super excited <laughs> and it happens every time. I mean, it's like every print, you just get so excited. But um, there are a lot of steps in the process but 
it's it's the way I work and I'm happy with that. So do you do a single dying for a single perhaps art quilt or accordion book or um, what I tend to do is I when I come up with a group of images or I tend to uh, most of my work has maybe five to seven images and five to seven pretty large screens. And so I tend to choose the images first and then start to die in the, the what I think I want to express in terms of these. So for example, <clears throat> the hand dyed pieces that are done in the American Portrait series are very much in greens and golds and some blues and they're all over dyed. So each piece of fabric is dyed at least two or three times. And, but then again, with the Native Americans, I feel like those can go more bold and more colorful, more hot. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really fun um, to kind of, and then I have a whole Steel Town series and those are all kind of gritty and gray. And so uh, I die based on what I want, kind of like probably what Sarah would do. She picks her paint colors based on the mood she's looking to set. That's how I work on the dye. And, and so I have some scraps left over, but I print everything that I make. I go in with a huge stack to print mm -hmm. and come home with a huge stack. <laughs> Do you work um, in like a print studio? I know that um, a lot of times printmakers have to go to print shops. Um, I do. Um, yeah. I can print at home. Um, during the pandemic, I did print. Um, in fact, this, this book that I held up, these are little. This was during mm -hmm. the pandemic because um, I can print. I have a print table, so I can print small images at home. But I go, I'm lucky I have um, a facility on the north side of Pittsburgh, Kayla, um, called Artist Image Resource. And you rent studio time. And they have, a, it's a full print shop. So when I, when I print, I do leave my house. That's the only piece of the puzzle that I, that's outside of my house. So asking, the next question is, is asking about the significance of the titles of your work. Um, Sarah, what was the title for your piece in this? Um, mine was called Partly Sunny. Okay, and the significance? Um, okay, so it kind of has like a double meaning. Um, the first, um, it kind of was talking about the Ohio weather. Um, it was a partly sunny day and I got this inspiration when I was um, at Stroud's Run and it is um, a picture of kind of this scene where I was contemplating um, like how, what is my place in Athens and Appalachia as a person that wasn't born here. I was born in Columbus. And so, um, you know, it was just a partly sunny day and I was just immersed in nature and appreciating the beautiful, beautiful Appalachian forest and scenery that we don't have in Columbus, not even a little bit. Um, Stroud's Run. And then another, I'm sorry. Stroud's Run is a beautiful park. I've canoed there. Yeah, it's, it's really special because it brings the Ohio University students together and it also pulls in people from the community and everybody just hangs out in nature and everybody you know is probably just as appreciative of the beautiful um park that is right up the road from OU it's incredible and so that is the first aspect of the title and then also um my mom would always call me sunny when i was a little kid um and so i felt like this is athens is like a part of me like strouds appalachia ou it's all part of me so partly sunny mm -hmm. i liked the title yeah <laughs> great that's great well, my titles aren't really magical. Um, 
I mean, the summer harvest, obviously, it's on vintage feed sacks. It, it just feels, it felt to me like those images were happening in the middle of harvest. Spirits remembered for the Native American women is just, it, it's it, a couple of the Native American um, pieces have the word spirit or spirits in them. And like I mentioned, I wanted to close that series and make sure that I had included the women and so I wanted to, that's why it was remembered. In other words, don't forget that, you know, the women in the, in the tribes were a critical component of the survival of the tribes. Um, and then the other Native American piece, which is in this um, exhibition is called White House Guest Book. And first of all, it was a book. So that was kind of fun, but the images were originally, um, watercolors that were taken at the White House. In 1821 to 1822, President Monroe at the time invited important chiefs and some of their wives to the White House to supposedly negotiate tribal you know, issues and so forth. And so those, they were hand colored portraits and then I converted them into um, multi-colored silk screens. So that was where that White House guest book, they were guests at the White House and they all have on jewelry and, and, uh, and medals and things that were given to them as guests of the White House in 1821-22. Very nice. All right. So who goes next? Sarah, I think. Okay. Um, drawing on paper or drawing digitally? What is everybody's preference? I don't know that Hela and I actually draw per se, um, but I do, like you mentioned, Sarah, um, after I made my first couple really big art quilts, I realized that if I could lay, sort of lay my images out in Photoshop, that I had a better concept of how many prints I needed, what the coloration could be, and so forth. So I do rely on Photoshop for that. And of course, I definitely re rely on Photoshop to clean up. I use a lot of historic images. So the backgrounds are removed, the cracks in the photographs are removed, you know, they're cleaned up to make a really nice silk screen. Yeah, I, I would have to say that I do sketch my ideas on paper much more than I would use digital. Um, I, I would love to know more about how to work in um, the programs like Photoshop, but that takes a lot of time that I just haven't devoted to it. So sketching on paper more than, and then I will, if I have a piece that I'm using as the canvas, I'll roughly uh, sketch the the main lines of what it is I'm trying to, just to get perspective, that type of thing. But yeah, paper for me. <laughs> okay, and then I guess I'm next, and that would be, I think we have a, a little bit of an answer from Sarah and probably a little bit already of an answer from, from Hala, but where do you find your inspiration? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Hala. Okay. Um, yeah, I would, I would have to say mostly nature. Um, just natural. A lot of my pieces, my art pieces, I... I still do a lot of artisan work, so I'll make things like my hat or um, useful. My business card actually says felted art and useful items because <laughs> I still I still probably do more um, artisan type craft work than I do artwork. So I didn't spend a whole career. My career was in environmental science and I kind of did crafts on the side. So. Now that I have more time, I'm, I'm getting more into the artistic end of it, but only partially and um, enjoying it. But I'd have to say I have, in, I have so many, you know, a walk through my woods gives me 
way more ideas than I have years left to do something. Mm -hmm. so, but mostly in nature, we do a, a family vacation with our kids and grandkids every year, usually in Pennsylvania or West Virginia. And uh, we all take a ton of photographs and uh, several of those have become wool paintings that I've done, but way more up there in my head than I'll ever have time to put into practice. And Sarah? I, um, I find my inspiration um, in my day-to-day -day life and just figuring out like where do I fit in with the world around me? Um, you know, especially like as a young adult, I'm 21 years old, so I'm gonna go, you know, I just, I left home and I came to Athens and it was the first big step. And then, you know, I'm gonna go out into the world and find a career and um, hopefully find a career in the arts. And, you know, I just, I have a lot of, ideas about the world as like a young person who just likes to have as many I like to have as many experiences as I can and I feel like I'm really interested in how where you are physically like affects where you are mentally um so it's kind of that like psychogeography mm -hmm. It's fascinating, Sarah. I'm so envious. I mean, I'm in my seventh decade. So, you know, I don't have, I, I sometimes, you know, imagine what it must be like, you know, to be a student in, in today's world in the university. Um, and, and I mean, geez, we didn't have computers. We didn't have Photoshop. We didn't have anything. Yeah. But I was processing black and white film in, in a dark room. So it's sort of fascinating for me to look in retrospect of how things have changed so much. I'm sure Hala can agree with me on that. And I think that what you may have in your future is sort of, um, you know, with all of the talk about AI, artificial intelligence, artwork, and so forth, you know, what may become available to you is just going to be mind blowing. So and I think, um, you know, you're where you are physically versus where you are uh, in terms of like the digital space, you know, mm -hmm. they're it's both place affecting mind and peace of mind and all that. And it's, yeah, like where you are physically and, you know, where you are on the internet can be completely different. Um, but kind of a person's virtual habits and um, how you exist online. That's another concept that I think about a lot as I'm ma making these pieces and coming up with my inspiration and coming up with my ideas behind the different pieces. So it is important. Well, it is, it's interesting about, yeah. because I recently um, attended a lecture from, um, by Michael James, who is a very, very well-known textile artist. And one of the sentences he started the entire lecture with was, your location creates your work. And he was referring to geographical location. He's my age and he was referring to location and how his work was affected by moving from um, the Boston area to the middle of Nebraska. And so for you, you've left, I know Columbus very well, and so you left Columbus and went to Athens, which is a smaller community, but it, it's so picturesque there, you know, when you drive into Athens, having been fortunate enough to have been at the Dairy Barn a couple times, um, it's, it's quite lovely, that whole area. So I can see how that could influence your work. Absolutely. But, it, but it's very interesting too, because if, for Patty and I, if we think about the things that we have seen over the past 50 or 60 or, you know, I don't remember, I don't count that first 10 years, but the, because <laughs> I'm also, and when I think about all the changes in the world and in the, in the medias for the arts and not just, not just visual arts, but performing arts and all the things that have changed over those years, and then think about the 50 or more years you have ahead of yourself, and what we can't comprehend, I would never have imagined what I've seen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And 
it's really interesting to know that that you have ahead of you, Sarah, um, the unknown to explore. It's exciting, yeah. I just look forward to taking in as many opportunities as I can to kind of gain like a broader perspective of the world because like at the end of the day, you can only really paint your experience, you know? Right. And how you are perceiving um, the stuff that you're hearing about and experiencing day to day. And I'm also glad you're with us, Sarah, because Hala and I are both textile um, people. And I think that because of our age and our generational upbringing, we were more in, in, in sort of inclined to choose what is what was considered women's work. So whether mm -hmm. it's whether it's a patchwork quilt or an art quilt or whatever, it was it was sort of that was the more acceptable vein of, you know, I don't recall even when I was getting my minor in photography, there were not that many women in the paint studios. There were, you know, so it's really, really interesting to, I'm also the one thing I do want to mention is to be a part of this exhibition, which is all media. It's always for me a huge, um, uh, I always feel really wonderful about that because I feel like, okay, my textile work is, has been has been evaluated and juried by a juror who was looking at paintings and watercolors and photographs and and work like Kayla's and and ceramics and all I mean there's a lot of media in this exhibition. So for me, having a piece chosen for this exhibition means more in a sense than having, a piece chosen for a big quilt exhibition, for example. So it's very, it's an interesting perspective for, for me anyway. Really interesting, Patty, because one of the things that, of course, I don't see my media in many galleries that I'm in. Um, I'm, I, I, I kind of have a feeling that the difference in the media, the, the, the rareness I per, perhaps of the, wool painting is one of the attractions I mean where I, I don't consider myself a paint artist for example um to, to be able, I couldn't do what Sarah does and that's okay um but it's interesting because I got to see this exhibit at the dairy barn and it is an amazing exhibit with so many different medias and outlooks and yet it's all still pulled together mm -hmm. in of Appalachia. It's just, it's pretty, it, it was pretty humbling to see the, the whole um, exhibit. It really was. I think it's also really interesting that you point out, Patty, um, that uh, there weren't many women painters when you were um, studying um, in undergrad because I feel like most of the people in my painting classes are women. And, you know, like being a woman in Appalachia definitely does mean something different to everybody in this exhibit based on, you know, age and other demographics. Um, yet we all have these ties as women to Appalachia and yeah, that's like astonishing. It's really cool to have such different perspectives about what it means to be a woman of Appalachia, but you know, we're all included in this exhibition nonetheless. Mm -hmm. I mean, even after 70 plus years, I'm still a small town girl from Springfield. It's kind of how I, it, it's hard to, for me to move away from that. I've lived in Pittsburgh for over 40 years, but I'm still an Ohio girl. I'm still that you know, that's the root of me. And that's at the core of the work I, I produce. And so it, it, you know, I think you are right, Sarah, geography means more than we all realize sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Are we doing another question? I guess, Sarah, it's your turn. Is it or is it Hala's? I think it might be Hala's. That's no problem. One of the questions that I, on my list here, and then I wanted to ask is, what are you currently creating? Go ahead. Um, okay. 
I am currently creating a three foot by four foot oil painting. Um, I'm trying new techniques that I'm learning in my advanced painting class with John Sabra, um, where I'm working on a smoother canvas. Um, I took more high quality reference images and I spent a lot more time on Photoshop creating um, like a mock-up composition that I was happy with. Um, and, you know, I sketched everything out. I blocked out some of the colors with acrylics and oil. And um, I'm about to start the process of kind of like sculpting the faces with paint in the image. And um, I'm really excited about how that will turn out. So that is like the main project that I'm working on right now. Um, I'm taking an anatomical drawing class. And so um, we have critique on Wednesday and I'm working on those drawings um, of the muscular system, um, which is helping with my figure drawing abilities immensely. And, you know, just understanding human anatomy in general, it's a really fascinating class. That's wonderful. Well, I am in the midst of, um, as I mentioned, I think I have made my last Native American and concluded for the most part, my American portraits. Um, my earlier work that I created in the late eighties and early and, and into the nineties was more personal um, issues of, um, that addressed my personal life and images that were mine. And so, based, I think in, inspired partly because of my age, I think about currently more often, well, if I only can make so many more pieces, what is it I want to say before I'm done? So my last piece I made um, was based on self-portraits I had taken when I was in college in photography. We had to take self-portraits that no one else was allowed to be in the room, and you had to you know, I had my camera, I mean, I had a camera in those days, on a tripod and, you know, set the timer, jumped into a chair. But what I discovered when I was going through those old um, images is they were taken the year that Roe v. Wade was passed. So I used those images and my last piece is called Roe, White and Blue. And I worked in reverse and had those images printed digitally and then over dyed them, screen printed them with patterning rather than, you know, a portraiture. And so I realized that, that it, 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 because I was just so aghast. <laughs> and so I, you know, I had gone through my adult life without pretty much ever having to think about that. And so I created row white and blue, and then I realized that I really did want to move more into the idea of personal imagery again, like I had done 20 years ago. So that's what I'm currently working on. And my aging body. The comparison, I'm seeing those photos um, because I, at the time, I didn't think much about it. I, I did them all in the nude. So I didn't think when I took them into, into class that my self-portraits were gonna surprise anyone, but they did. But at the time, that's kind of how I felt. I was like, oh, well, you know. So, and so I look at those and think, oh my gosh, look what's happened. And so that's also the other thing is I'd like to perhaps, you know, do something that compares that body and this body 50 years later. Very and bold. <laughs> I'm, I'm not afraid of that. <laughs> That's wonderful. I don't feel like most of my work, I love doing landscapes. And so I don't feel like I, most of my, and, and again, I'm only partially an artist and partially a craftsperson. So um, I don't feel like my paintings have had any real social statements. Um, I, I will continue to work on the beautiful landscapes I see here in West Virginia. Um, maybe because of this time of year, I'm really being drawn towards the birds that are returning uh, to our area in the spring and the flowers that are just 
you know, we have some daffodils that we planted in the woods that are, you know, pop up in surprise every year and things. So I'm, I'm kind of being pulled towards maybe learning a little more about details of how to paint a wool with wool, uh, some of the birds in my area, but that's, uh, I don't know whether I'll go down that road or not yet. <laughs> I like the, uh, it sounds very idyllic to me, what you, oh. how, you know, the area you live on such a big piece of land and, and I think that that sounds so lovely. Yes, we, it is wonderful. We, uh, we're actually only five miles from an interstate intersection, but that five miles is a windy road mm -hmm. along an and so we don't hear anything back here. It is very Id idyllic. Well, it's like Sarah said, I mean, it, it really does come back to this whole concept of geography is creating your work as well and influencing your work very that's, much as well. That's very true. Mm -hmm. I think it's also interesting to consider like how you control the geography that you're around to some extent, but then, you know, part of it is how you you're born like you're born in an area and the influences growing up you know that the ideas that you form about the world based on where you grow up and how you grow up and how that just affects you all throughout life and you know the stuff that you're drawn to in your work it's reoccurring themes that I'd imagine kind of stay with you throughout your entire your entire artistic practice I think in a way you're right, Sarah. <laughs> I think in, in 40 or 50 years when you're, when you're still working away, you're going to look at this time period and say, I'm still there. That, that woman, this is what I do see. In fact, when I just did this last piece was it was sort of so retrospective to use images that I took 50 years ago, yet I thought to myself, they still mean something to me and that woman is still me. So a change. That's beautiful, yeah. Yeah, it's still relevant. It's always going to be relevant. What you do will always be relevant. Absolutely.